Hey folks, I'm J.B. Shreve with the Faithful Considerations podcast. Wanted to give you a little heads up on this podcast series that we're releasing right here, Manifesto, Life, Politics, and Reality in the Kingdom of God. This is a look at the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 to 7. Now, the only reason I, reason I wanted to put in this little uh, little bit of an intro beyond what we'll be doing in the podcast itself is to let you know we actually have a video series. This series which was originally released as a video series through YouTube. You can go to jbshreve.com and access that. So I wanted to do an audio version too for all of our podcast subscribers, our audio podcast subscribers. But I wanted to let you know that every once in a while within this podcast, I'll refer to visuals, um, maybe something that you're going to see instead of hear within the, the episode itself. And you can access that for free, jbshreve.com, the Faithful Considerations website. You should also subscribe to the YouTube channel. So I'm going to put this little intro at the forefront of every one of these episodes in the series as far as the audio version is concerned. Just want to make sure that you had it. And yeah, I think that'll do it. Let's jump into today's podcast episode, Manifesto Life, Politics, and Reality in the Kingdom of God. Hey folks, I'm J.B. Shreve with the Faithful Considerations Podcast. We're back. We're continuing our journey through the Sermon on the Mount, the Manifesto Life, Politics, and Reality in the Kingdom of God. That's what we're calling it. We're at episode 19 today. We're going to look at this idea called Turning the Other Cheek. Now, in our last episode, we looked at the, the emphasis of the manifesto to really shift our attention away from our own strength and, and really towards utter total reliance on God. And this, this even comes down to the words, the expressions we use. Jesus is telling us, don't build a life of reliance upon your own strength, on your own power. Don't You don't really even have any real strength or power. Just trust in God. Place your dependence upon His strength, His power. Anything beyond this standard, anything less than, than this standard that Jesus is giving us here, is not just missing the mark, but quite frankly, it's a nature of living and, uh, and life that comes from Satan himself, right? Look, look at this from Matthew 5, 37. Let your yes be yes and your no, no, for whatever is more than these is from the evil one. So as we continue through the manifesto, Jesus really goes on to emphasize this perspective, this posture for life. This, this is probably one of the more famous parts of the manifesto even if it's not understood all that well, okay? Matthew 5, verses 38 to 42, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. If if anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. So, while well, researching for this series, I read a lot of different books, a lot of different material, but I came across this obscure, I guess it's obscure, it was obscure to me anyway, but it's a somewhat frowned upon book by the Russian author, Leo Tolstoy. Now, Tolstoy, of course, is the, the famous Russian author from the 19th century. His most famous works are like War and Peace. Some people think that's the greatest novel ever written, Anna Karenina. Tolstoy became a Christian in the 1870s, around the age of 50. Biographers say he experienced what, was, what they term a spiritual crisis. He became a, a committed member of the Greek Orthodox Church, which is the dominant uh, denomination in Russia. It was, that was the case then. It's also the case now. But as Tolstoy searched the scripture and continued writing, even detailing his own sp- spiritual journey, he soon found he couldn't countenance the teaching and the methods of the church. Tolstoy, just like I'm describing in this series, he recognized that the tenets of man-made religion and its institutions, well, they were really far removed from the tenets and the standards of the kingdom of God those taught by Jesus in his manifesto of the Sermon on the Mount that we're looking at. So by 1901, the corrupt and soon to be collapsing czarist government of Russia, they were closely tied to the Greek Orthodox Church, and they had Tolstoy under constant surveillance, 
right? The church eventually even excommunicated this author, the famous author, despite his uh, aristocratic heritage and fame. And his book, he wrote this book called The Kingdom of God is Within You. And Tolstoy turns to the Sermon on the Mount and he marvels at the gap between the standards that Jesus taught and the standards taught by the religious leaders of his own day. So many historians and critics, they say that Tolstoy became what they term an anarcho-pacifist at this point in, in his life. That was a philosophy he developed by looking specifically at the Sermon on the Mount and specifically verses like this, where Jesus talked about turning the other cheek and giving up your cloak if anyone asked of you. So let me just read a passage to you from this book by Leo Tolstoy. And such are, without exception, all the criticisms of the cultivated believers who, therefore, do not understand the perilousness of their position. The only way out for them is the hope that, by using the authority of the church, of antiquity, of holiness, they may be able to confuse the reader. Now, he's talking about those who read the, these verses from the Sermon on the Mount. And draw him away from the thoughts of reading the gospel for himself and of considering the question with his own mind. And in this, they are successful. Now, I highly encourage anyone out there who's interested in reading the classics, take the time to read this book by Tolstoy, okay? okay? It goes a long way in alerting readers how even in our own day, our own faith is so corrupted by, by nationalism and other things that have nothing to do with the teachings of Jesus Christ. At the same time as I say that though, when I read Tolstoy's book, The Kingdom of God is Within You, I'll be honest, I like, of what he, I like a lot of what he says, but it does strike my heart as a bit too harsh. Now, don't get me wrong. I know Jesus often came across as a bit too harsh. There's a point in the book of John where he's telling people to eat his flesh and drink his blood, okay? I get that. But Jesus also presented mercy. He also presented grace. He presented redemption for the people. And as much as I want to enjoy Tolstoy's philosophy and teachings from the Sermon on the Mount, I find those attributes missing. The kingdom of God is built upon the hearts of men. And that requires mercy and redemption. When I read Tolstoy, it almost feels like a hard swing away from one counterfeit religious perspective toward another hardline religious perspective, all right? And for me, while the approach is right, Tolstoy missed the heart of what Jesus is really saying in these words from the manifesto. Tolstoy is right, right? Jesus was preaching about a different kingdom, a different way of life, and one that supersedes this world. We're to give our hearts to the kingdom of God and let, let that guide our life. But there was too much focus on opposition to the kingdoms of this world in Tolstoy's book. We have to remember, when we strip away the religious, the traditional perspectives of this manifesto of the kingdom of God, this Sermon on the Mount, as it's usually called in our, in our Bibles, we find a terrifically revolutionary, world-changing, world-defying message. That's why Tolstoy was so shocked by what he discovered in the teachings of Jesus compared to the teachings and the traditions presented in the church institutions of his day. That's also why so many social reformers from Gandhi to, to Martin Luther King Jr., they've been drawn to these words of Jesus in the manifesto. You've heard it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you not to resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. The nonviolence movement that became so influential in the mid-20th century through the likes of like Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr., it rooted a lot of its philosophy to this very passage right here from the Sermon on the Mount. And you can pretty, pretty easily see that, right? The idea was that rather than retaliating in kind, rather than fighting fire with fire, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, a person could protest evil by shaming the evildoers. It was kind of brilliant. It made this idea of turning the other cheek and, and giving away your cloak and, and going two miles instead of one a decision rather than abuse. If a person was being oppressed, well, then they could choose to not fight back. And by not fighting back, their oppressor made a spectacle of themselves. Now, the oppressor had to either choose to continue to oppress or to continue to abuse and victimize and be shamed by their own evil, or they could be convicted by the, the courage of the person who was willing to activate this powerful principle from Jesus, from his teaching from the Sermon on the Mount. During the Civil Rights Movement, 
here in America, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was particularly focused upon this teaching from Jesus. He even created this list of 10 commandments for those who were going to join him in the nonviolent protest movements during the 1950s and 60s. Just look at these. It says, meditate daily on the teachings and life of Jesus. This is from Dr. King. Remember always that the nonviolent movement seeks justice and reconciliation, not victory. Walk and talk in a manner of love, for God is love. Pray daily to be used by God in order that all people might be free. Sacrifice personal wishes in order that all people might be free. Observe with both friend and foe the ordinary rules of courtesy. Seek to perform regular service for others and not for the world. Uh, I'm sorry, and for the world. Refrain from violence of the fist, tongue, or heart. Strive to be in good spiritual and bodily health. Follow the, dire the directions of the movement and of the captain of it on a demonstration. If you've ever seen old pictures and videos from the civil rights movement, then you've probably seen images of protesters marching with signs that read, I am a man, right? You would think, well, of course you're a man, but it wasn't as obvious as that. To oppress a person means a person has to demonize and, and belittle their victim to be less than a man, less than human. The nonviolence movement aimed to give dignity to the oppressed people and shame the oppressors. Now, don't get me wrong here. I'm a huge fan of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. To me, he's one of the greatest Americans of the 20th century, if not the greatest. And I believe in the power of nonviolence resistance. I truly do. But all that being said, I still don't think that is really what Jesus was saying in this passage from the manifesto. The idea of nonviolence works in a public setting, in a public protest, but what about in private? What about behind closed doors where the abuser, the oppressor, is not publicly shamed by his own actions? Jesus didn't say follow these rules of the manifesto only in public. This was to be a lifestyle. You've heard it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you not to resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. But if anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. The problem with seeing this only in the context of the nonviolence protest movement is that it puts too much emphasis on the dignity of human beings. The victim claims his dignity by rising up and the power of nonviolent resistance. The abuser, the oppressor, is shamed because they've been shamed, they've shamed and they've abandoned their dignity, right? Now, part ways right there. Outside the redemption of Christ, human beings don't have dignity. We have good intentions that always fall short of the mark. That's what scripture teaches us. We're not innately good. This is shocker here, okay? We are born in sin. If, if allowed to get away with it, fallen and sinful human beings will follow their self-interest into the most excessive abuses, most sinful of acts imaginable. Human history has proven this over and over again. Now, Jesus is certainly leading us to a higher path, a new way of leaving, living, but it's not a protest movement. There's nothing wrong with nonviolent, the nonviolent resistance movement. I'm all for it. But Jesus is talking about something actually bigger than that in this passage. You've heard it was said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue, to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And if anyone and whoever compels you to go one mile... Go with him too. Give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. When Jesus says, you've heard it was said, he wasn't only talking about the Ten Commandments and thou shalt not kill. This eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth idea of justice went back well before the Ten Commandments. The Code of Hammurabi, all right, one of the, the earliest legal codes of human civilization, it was developed in Babylon, was built on this idea. Everything would be equaled out. Injustice would exist, but when it was identified, there would be consequences. That was the apex of what human justice could achieve. Well, ultimately, that's still the same standard we rely on today. If we can bring equity to everything when there are crimes and injustices, then we can hold things steady, right? That's the best that humans can do, best they can hope to do. But Jesus says, you've heard it that said, but I say, do it differently, right? Jesus is telling us to place our trust in him, not in this world. This world, the highest achievements that the systems of human civilizations can bring us, it'll never be enough. Real important here, human justice will never be enough. 
and will never create real fairness or real justice. We will not find justice and fairness in this world. It's just not going to happen. The nonviolent resistance movement got it partly right. Since we won't find justice in this world, we should remove our hope, remove our expectations from the systems and oppressors and abusers of this world. Quit expecting them to give you justice. Don't look for it. Don't, don't hope for it. It's not going to happen. But rather than putting our stock in our own dignity, our own self-worth, Jesus is saying, uh-uh, trust in God. Turn the other cheek. Let God flex his power. Walk the extra mile. Let God take care of you. Now, people balk at this. They don't like this interpretation of the manifesto. They think it's a cop-out. It's too passive. But I assure you, the one thing this is not is passive. This requires an active, assertive transition from placing our hopes and expectations for survival in this world to placing our hopes and expectations upon God and His strong arm. He may not give us the results or the answers we want. We might not even see the end result. That's not the point. The point is that our hearts and focus, remember it always goes back to the heart, our heart and focus has shifted. But dealing in the transactions of justice and injustice within this world to relying on the king of the kingdom of God to enact justice for us. That's where we want to move to. It's not our justice. It's his justice. God, do what you will. I put my trust in you. The model for us is this. Jesus Christ himself. He faced the cross. He endured death. It may have looked passive on the outside. But it was a very active, a very deliberate movement that Jesus enacted, that he modeled for us. And he actively engaged in that movement to the, fil- to, to the fulfillment of God's will and justice. He prayed, not my will, but your will be done. Now, this is the heart of the manifesto of the kingdom of God. Does it seem like it, it doesn't fit in this world? That's right, it doesn't. It's the mode of, of operations for another world, another kingdom. Jesus is calling us to reach out and pull the kingdom of God into the earth as it is in heaven. That's how it's done. Now, in the next episode, we're going to look at the last of our recalibrations, right? I encourage you to read over Matthew 5 after watching this video today. Consider what Jesus is saying. Consider what he's calling you to personally. Where is Jesus calling you to rely on God rather than this world and the instincts for self-preservation? That's the place in your life where God is wanting to build his authority and his kingdom.